Welcome to the Off the Road Again podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Ross. And I'm Dan. Welcome back, Dan. Welcome back. Uh, Thank you very much. This is our podcast about anything and everything off-road. We talked about rally cars last week. I'm not going to bring it up again. Uh, thank you very much, Tanner Faust, for coming on the show. <laughs> it was fun. I still can't believe he came on. Uh, as always, we are continuing to be socially distanced. Ross is in Connecticut. I'm in the Midwest, and Dan's on the West Coast. Yep. That, that's it. Like we, We're back to our normal time zones, East, Central, West, or Pacific, sorry. Yeah, exactly. probably 95% of our shows have been that. Yeah. Something about uh, the West Coast collecting uh, automotive yeah. journalists and or off-road enthusiasts. <laughs> it's almost like there's more to do on the West Coast if you like cars and off-roading. Well, there's definitely more places to go off-roading, a lot more open land you can wander oh, yeah. around on. Yeah, the desert's yeah. what, less than an hour away? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I go with less than an hour because I'm never sure how traffic affects that for everybody. <laughs> well, yeah, there. we do talk distance in terms of minutes instead of miles. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much how it is out here. Yeah, that, That's that, funny. That breaks my Midwest brain every time I like Google yeah. map something and it's like three miles, 45 minutes. I'm what? That, yep. I don't, does not compute. Um, not compute. <laughs> the news. The news. Where do you want to start? Well, Bronco deliveries are happening. I, um, I trolled the Bronco forums today and saw that there are actual customer deliveries happening. People are taking actual delivery of Bronco, which is a finally. Wasn't that um, like l- two weeks ago that they just got production rolling? Like Less than, less than. Yeah. Which makes me think they probably had production ready to rock and then just hit post on all of the news uh but yeah no um people have them which is fantastic a car manufacturer is good at manufacturing cars i'm confused car manufacturers good at manufacturing news yeah they are (laughs) so we but we've been on that for since since we started the podcast about how good ford's pr team has been about just dropping bronco stuff to us for forever like (laughs) Well, again, the uh, the same company that built the Ford GT without anybody knowing. True. But then let so. us all know at what that was at Detroit, right? Wasn't it the North American show? Yes. It was just like, hey, by the way, we're going to talk about this Raptor or Ford. I think it was like Focus RS in, in the blue. And they were like, by the way, here's also the Ford GT. Yep. <laughs> so good. So, yeah. So Bronco uh, deliveries of Bronco are happening Santa Cruz, Hyundai Santa Cruz, which we've talked about pretty endlessly, are also uh, also happening, which is soon because they announced we have a guest, <laughs> a special, a very special guest, special guest, future off roader. Um, yeah, no, we we've been talking about Hyundai Santa Cruz since before you know actual production was announced. And they've started production. So yeah, that was a, a much quicker turnaround than Bronco, which is... Um, that gestated a long time, though. I mean, I used I worked for Hyundai in the early 2000s, and there was always some kind of a truck being talked about. It never really huh. went anywhere physically while I was there, but they've been thinking about it for a long time. The only- Since the early 2000s? I was there from 2000 to 2006, and it was a topic. (laughs) (laughs) So so obviously, go ahead, Chris. The only thing it doesn't have is the bed extender, and I wanted that to be the one thing so bad. Like, it was like the bedsides themselves were supposed to be like... Telescopic or something? Yeah, they were supposed to like come... There was supposed to be a a narrower one that was inside of... And And they would come out, out, and and then then the the same tailgate. tailgate... yeah. Like the tailgate was somehow attached to them, so it would move with them. Ooh, I like so that. So I've owned an Avalanche, and Honda just dropped off a Ridgeline, and I've probably opened and closed the tailgate this sideways, you know, like a traditional, like a, um, what, what? Like, a, like an old, like a swing out. Yeah, 
Like it's exactly. And I've probably done that 15 times already just to go, oh my God, every single truck should have this. So no, yeah. something like that, that if, if they had incorporated that, that would be a game changer. Uh, but yeah, so th- I mean, those are the, the two less exciting topics of news. Uh, even less exciting is Grand Cherokee L reviews have kind of hit the, uh, hit the internet this week. So the Grand Cherokee L is basically just a three row Grand Cherokee that uh, previews the two row Grand Cherokee coming this fall. Yes, Chris, Chris brought up the concept. The very, Santa very Cruz slow concept. in my producing yeah. tonight. The but, uh, se- lack of second monitors ruining me. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Of course, that was perfectly period correct with, you know, the wannabe cafe racer in the bed. Right. Um, yeah, so Grand Cherokee L reviews are out. Everybody is saying it's fantastic. No surprise. Better than the current WK2 Grand Cherokee in every way. So expect a two-row Grand Cherokee, which I think, so this is WK, so that's WL Grand Cherokee this fall. Um, and but yeah. Do we know what chassis the L is on? Is it That's still, a very good question. Is it still Durango based or is it like the, the Grand Wagoneer and the oh. Wagoneer or Ram 1500 based? That's a great question. And I'm going to find out right now. <laughs> because I don't know. know. <laughs> well, no, if I ever get one to pull the wheels off, I'll let you know. <laughs> but no, I don't have that off. I don't have that answer chambered. Okay, body and chassis of the WL Grand Cherokee is the FCA. I'm going to botch the pronunciation of this so badly. <laughs> Giorgio, G I O R G I O, which is very Italian sounding, unlike Stellantis. Uh, Did you spell Gigaro? Gigaro, is that what it is? I, I don't know. I, I make no excuses. Uh, Interestingly, Wikipedia is telling me that the related vehicle is the Alfa Romeo Stelvio. So in some way, it's related to that. Um, For the L? For the L. So it's got to be like scalable? Yes. Modular platforms. And Mm -hmm. thus related to the Julia uh, and the upcoming Maserati Gracale, which is a smaller-ish crossover thing okay yeah i didn't didn't uh, see that coming for what uh, everyone is touting as like the first good three-row suv from fca right durango is great that's true very good so yeah that's it that's on yeah that done for grand cherokee uh much more exciting and this is i mean technically there's no embargo on this because it hasn't actually it's not like a press release that was just not released but jeep is fighting bronco with what's going to be called potentially rubicon extreme or rubicon recon extreme Uh, this has been swirling for a while and i have to read it off my phone because very quickly after it was posted overland expo deleted the post so somebody got a phone call yeah, somebody get it by accident. Um, so let's this see. This is related to that cryptic picture they had of the vehicle Both. with a 40.4 yep. at the back. And today was a 42.7, which, you know, you can only speculate until they actually tell you what it is. So mm-hmm. this, is, this is courtesy of Overland Expo's uh, deleted post, which tells us that the extreme recon, and there, there is skepticism on it co- being called extreme because Chevy had extreme trademarked and may still yep. for the Blazer and S10 extreme, which are for somebody growing up with those, you know, in their like fascination world, still pretty cool. So extreme recon says 315.70.17 KO2s, 17 by 8 beadlock capable wheels, 456 to 1 axle ratio, one and a half inch lift. And then it says do, 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 optional 488s. And that 
like gears somehow yeah somehow ends up at a hundred to one crawl ratio and the cryptic posting they're saying is 40.4 degree departure angle which is a weird one to lead with um 47.7 approach angle and uh 33.6 inches of water fording depth and 12.9 inches of ground clearance. Hmm. So and that that's it. Some somebody ran all those numbers into Slack the other day on Universe and Camille. My main takeaway was just wasn't Bronco like when when Ford released numbers for Bronco, everything was infinitesimally better than Jeep. Like the approach angle was like 0.1 better. The departure angle was like maybe 0.2 better. The ground clearance, I think was like 0.1 better. Like I, I felt like every number was like, get it just close enough, but beat them. And so this is yeah. Jeep reversing like, that. TRX and new Raptor were like that too. Right. Uh, it's just, it's marketing mm-hmm. games. I applaud them both. Like, keep it up. We give us something to talk about. I'm not buying one. Uh, <laughs> right. Cause it doesn't have enough seats for and- me, but Ross is buying a Jeep. I buy a Jeep. Yeah, no, but expectations are that the extreme recon package is going to cost somewhere in the range of like three thousand to five thousand dollars. So, who knows? I mean, oh, would that be on top of a Rubicon? It's it would, it would be an additional package on top of a Rubicon. The the same way the Sasquatch package is a package on top of Bronco, supposedly. Well, you just. Hold on, you but just you said a that package on, on a package. Trim, yeah, that's Sasquatch right. can be applied to any trim. So Rub- recon yeah, know. on Rubicon. Think, right, but I think recon is only going to be available on yeah. Rubicon. In the same way 392 is only available on Rubicon. My favorite part is someone who's not going to understand anything that we're talking about right now, catching the clip the last 30 seconds of Sasquatch <laughs> can be applied to any trim <laughs> level. But recon can only be applied to Rubicon. <laughs> like, uh-huh. like, if you know, you know. Yeah, but if you don't, in code, yes, we we are three weird dudes right now. <laughs> yeah, and combine them, and you get extreme Sasquatch. <laughs> recon. Yeah, uh. extreme Sasquatch recon sounds like the next uh, TV show on Discovery. Uh, or some really weird challenge in the X Games. <laughs> or it's only available on Paramount Plus or some other streaming ah, bullshit that they're trying go. to make me pay for it right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm excited to see, like, I saw 392 in traffic the other day as a customer vehicle. So, like, just keep bringing me cool Jeeps that I get to stare at and I don't have to pay for. Like, I'm fully on board. <laughs> it, it looked completely ubiquitous. Like, it looked like nothing special. And I was like, oh, I got to put the windows down. He's going to make it sound so good. It sounded like the most boring Jeep ever. Mm-hmm. But, but it has an exhaust the button. Yeah, and, I know. Uh, he, he was in traffic. And so he was probably doing some normal, nice. Yeah. Dan, have you gotten a chance to play with the 392 yet? Not yet. I have not gotten my hands on it yet. It's definitely on my list. But nope, not yet. I, I so just like, love that. Got- Everyone's mm-hmm. takeaway is like, this is dumb and so much fun. I can see that, you know, because <laughs> ever since the Pentastar V6 came out, you know, that's that's a really decent motor. It seems like, you know, the whole V8 swap tendency that had been pretty strong before that motor came out kind of slowed down a little bit, but obviously it didn't Super go away. Trust. And people still want V8s and everything. And why not? But, oh, uh, of course. Yeah. yeah. Now, the Pentastar is a strong engine in every application. It's, yeah. you know, it's like the journalist trope is soulless, but it, it <laughs> like does the job and serves the purpose. Um, yeah. and the new fad is supercharging it, which, you know, five grand or six grand versus how much is a, a Hemi or a LS That's swap what- in it. Sean Holman just did that to his Jeep, right? Sean Holman did that. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And he almost rolled a 392. So, yeah, I saw that. He two wheeled it on his two wheeler magazine uh, photo shoot. Exactly. Yeah. All of a sudden, they're going to have to <laughs> rename the magazine. Yeah. yeah. It's four wheeler for everybody else. But when Sean's involved, nope, two wheeler. Two wheeler. Yep. You know, somebody's just walking around calling him two wheeler now, right? I hope so. <laughs> 
I don't know if that's a good or a bad nickname. So yeah, so that's the news. Huzzah. So local news. I know I know a guy who has access to an ID4. I'm gonna go uh, see oh. what that, that fully electric Volkswagen is all about. Hmm. Have you it'll... seen one in person yet? I have not. I'm going in completely unprepared. I mean, I'll, I'll take the camera. I'll do some research later, but yeah. Uh, don't worry, Jeff. I'll write it up. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I'm actually uh, looking forward to, I've driven an EV before, but it was like a Ford Transit Connect EV. And in like, it was like 2013. Ooh, special. Yeah. Like cool. forever ago kind of thing. Uh, when Ford was just like barely introducing any EVs to anything. So it, I'm very interested to see what Volkswagen Group has it, their take, basically. And I'm, I'm hoping it has the white interior, mm-hmm. because after talking to Tanner and Emmy about the one they raced in the Nora 1000, like the white interior interior for a desert race had to be the worst choice ever. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> or blue jeans, because they just become... Uh smudged <laughs> yeah exactly which who is it that released a white interior with blue jean friendly leather oh that exists is that a whole, yeah is that a um, volvo thing probably because i th- it the, was the yes, xc90 was. uh interior was the first like with the new iteration of the xc90 it was the first interior that i'd seen that was like entirely white and i was like that's absolutely gorgeous and all I can think about is how many colors my kids are going to turn all of those seats. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. wasn't blue jean friendly. No, it was a crown friendly. It wasn't goldfish friendly. <laughs> Nothing is goldfish friendly. French, French fry friendly. The yeah. worst is like sticky candy that has gotten through things. It's just no, thank you. Yeah, yeah. No. Um, anyways, okay. So report back on the ID four. Very curious. Definitely will. Um, seen a bunch of them in person, but haven't gotten up close. So, yeah, we have a, a VW e Golf. That's what my wife drives every day, and it's really nice. It's like a little electric GTI. It just, mm. you know, it's so uh, it just does the job. So, yeah, a bigger SUV that actually has a little bit more capability. Yeah. See, the thing that diverges the two, though, is that the Golf oh. is a known entity. And sure. golf is fantastic. And electric cars are fantastic. You put them together, and an electric golf is accordingly great. All it needs is some decent tires, and it's it's there. Didn't Camisa put, like, uh, like, like... You put PS4s on it. To, oh, it was PS4s, I thought. I think it was, it was PS4. Like cops PS4S, or PS4S, I think. PS4S. And I think he's threw, like, three or four sets of them. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Because he lights them up every time he can because it's electric. Who's going to yell at you? He's, right. Doesn't make any yeah. noise. No, fair. Yeah. No, electric, electric cars are the best. So, anyway, you have fun with the ID. I will try. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually hoping it's kind of boring and lame, and but it just gets 250 miles of range out of it. And like, it looks very, it, it's what I feel like a lot of us would want out of an electric vehicle just seating for five, cargo space. 250 miles of range. Mm-hmm. Sounds perfect. Mm-hmm. Yep. My heartbreak is just that it could have looked like something. It They could have brought to market the, the ID bus. buzz or the bus or whatever it's going to be called. I know. I keep seeing that. And that's, yeah, I want that. <laughs> right. A right, lot of that, people yeah. do. Let's see the electric, uh, the fastest uh, VW have, have bus that they've ever made. It's like, uh, I maybe like EV West has like blackmail over VW Group because <laughs> they keep swapping buses, but yet Volkswagen won't bring one to market. Like, yeah, that see for me and okay, so crash testing might have been a problem. Um, oh, for but, a bus, yeah, for a bus, if it was you know the same seating position as the way it used to be, but they could just move it back a little bit, and it's you know. But not as far as canoe. I mean, I was, I was, canoe was my next reference. Ah, oh like, man! Be able to see out of that thing. If you get into an accident in one of the canoe vehicles, you will know after the accident has happened. 
<laughs> so they're going to build those near me. Oh, really? They just announced uh, this last hiring? week. <laughs> I don't know. I'll have Sorry. to ask. Sorry. Well, not that close to me. It's in Tulsa. So like, <laughs> like relative to both of you right now, it's much closer. Yeah, it's not <laughs> saying much. So same time zone at least. But yeah, they uh, they announced they're going to build them down in Tulsa and they announced the it, the horror I got to try and find the imagery now. It was it was a very Oklahoman uh yeah. Was it was it a picture of just like an open field with here's our production facility? No, it was <laughs> it's worse. Just like nothing. It was worse? Yeah. They 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 put the big Oklahoma University logo on them. Oh, that's worse. Yeah. Uh and of course now I won't be able to find it. Oh, I found it. That's so bad. So bad. Audio listeners do have to turn to the video for this. So so for the audio listener, this this image was in the background of the presentation, and it is the canoe van truck and what looks like a a box truck version of the canoe that I hadn't seen yet, actually. And they slapped OU stickers all over this thing. They painted a maroon and then put them in the foreground of the football station. <laughs> it's all righty then. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it's not good. It reminds me of my favorite uh, TikTok or Instagram reel that I saw last week, which is all the high school seniors now going to college saying their name and where they're going to school, but they're from parts of the country where you're like, what in the world are they actually saying? <laughs> and after going through like three or four of these girls, they take the coach from the water boy who speaks Cajun the whole time that nobody knows what he's. And then they're like, yeah, it's the same difference. Nice. Yeah. I haven't seen that movie in a while. No. Oh. Um, You're not missing much. <laughs> what am I? So yeah, Ross, what left? Yes. Okay. What left? The Miata left. Miata's gone. Left on the, the V8 Forerunner's gone. The Miata's gone. Nothing showing was, up. Uh, you know, so, cur- I mean, currently the only <laughs> thing left in our household is my wife's CX-5. And until your press loaner Honda Ridgeline. The, the Ridgeline showed up yesterday. Um, I have that for the New Hampshire trip we're going on this weekend. So thank you to Honda. Um, it's that crazy HPD trim. So it has, <laughs> you know the bronze wheels and the fender flares and uh, wannabe TRD stickers. And that's about it. And it's like a $3,000 package. Um, the only but, version I've seen either, you know, with the new grill, you know, it seems like yeah. that's what they're pushing. Okay. Yeah. And it, it has the new, the new front end and it, it's actually, it's, subs- it, it's worlds better than the pre refresh second gen ridgeline like in this configuration and like I, I don't love the the one they gave me is white the one that everybody was driving out west was red um the white with the gold wheels doesn't look spectacular um it 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 exudes the persona of like a wannabe rally car, but you know, it doesn't have anything to actually follow up on that. Um, but you know, so it still has the cutout for the fuel door, still has a cutout for the fuel door on the fender flare, which I noticed the other day mm-hmm. on a much, yep. much older Nissan Frontier. They have the same cutout for the yep. fender. And the button for the fuel door is actually on the door itself, which is something I'd never seen before. Like the driver's oh, door? The driver door. When you open the door, like the actual physical door, uh, which I don't know why they did that, but okay. So yeah, so I, I've put about, you know, six miles on the ridge line since they dropped it off. And so far it is, it, it's great. You know, it, um, it's how many times did you open the tailgate over those six miles? More times than anybody should. Does, because, <laughs> yeah, the so having grown up, you know, around pickup trucks and then reading about the Ridgeline's swinging, laterally swinging tailgate, and then finally for the first time being able to like play with that, and then the in trunk in in bed trunk, yeah, is oh. like. It's, it's wild. And it's, it's, 
in all fairness, it's something that they can only package because of the platform on which it's based. Oh yeah. But it's, it, you know, it's something that seems so like so logical and so suited to the functions and purposes that most people use these vehicles for that mm-hmm. even though like quote unquote real pickup trucks, you know, body on frame, rear drive pickup trucks, even though they can't do this, you look at it and go, okay, I wish it could. Um, right. It's, it's brilliant. You know, um, well, it's, it's really good to have that lockable dry storage. There's, I have one beef with this truck. Is it the spare tire? It the is shops. the spare tire. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, the shots are, no, we can get to that later, but you know, the spare, imagine having, you know, a, uh, all that gear in front of it in the back and you're towing a trailer and you're going someplace and you have a flat. Now you got to disconnect the trailer, unload the quad or just keep the spare tire out, which is what my brother does. Cause he's got one of these, if you're going, okay. anywhere. so it's, it's, you don't have to do that. Right. So for the audio, I'm the, Inside the bed, the first two and a half feet, maybe two feet of bed actually lifts up and underneath it is a large, it's a large enough storage space that it actually has to have the federally mandated emergency release for like if you got locked in it. And then in front of that, also underneath the actual bed surface itself is where the spare tire lives. So in order to get that spare tire out, you have to take everything that you would have stored in that trunk area, <laughs> which I could be everything wrong about this. Bed if, if, because you can't lift it up yeah. if there's something in the bed. Yep. And everything in the bed, which, you know, if you have, if you have it loaded down with mulch or blocks or a quad or something and a trailer hooked up, you got to unload all of it to get to the spare. Um, I just want to know who's packed these items for a trip. Like soft side cooler I get, sleeping bag I get, toe strap I get, towel and blanket and guitar. Like I don't I don't need all that. That's that's a little like can't the blanket double as the towel? As somebody who lives fairly close to there, Woodstock. <laughs> uh, or maybe that's more red rocks. Like is that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> dirty hippies? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, so yeah, so the ridge line's here. The ridge line, the seats are amazing already, and you know, yeah. And the screen, the center screen, the infotainment is absolutely infuriating. So really, it's that bad. It's it's touch, wait, wait, wait. Okay, then it happens. Yeah. So oh, it is that bad. Which you know, I, I don't know what kind of life this thing's lived, but. Yeah, it I don't does remember not. being that slow on the one I've, I've driven. But I know earlier ones, I don't think they even had a volume knob. They had some. I think Honda went through a phase where they didn't do that. that I was think they complained. Had no volume knobs was definitely a Honda thing. This uh, this does have a volume knob. And I don't know. I mean, it's so it, it's like it's so good and it's so natural for what a pickup should be for 99% of pickup users. So I'm I'm about to put you know 700 miles on it, so we'll we'll see. But <laughs> yeah, and you know I I did uh, this relates to something else I wanted to talk about. But I mean, you know when this first came out uh, back in I don't know 2006, the first generation. Six. Oh six. That's, a, that's when about when I started working at Edmunds.com and somebody I was working with there had, uh, you know, they had one in the long-term fleet and they had, they cornered me because they had gone out to the racetrack in Death Valley, which is where the rocks move on that dry lake bed. And for years, nobody could figure out how they did it because nobody ever saw it. <laughs> I mean, there's rocks this big and trails behind them and they all kind of interweave with each other. And it's really cool. So anyway, he'd gone out there. It's deep in Death Valley. You have to go like 27 miles down a dirt road after the end of pavement, which is 100 miles into the park. So you really committed oh, wow. to that. Oh, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. Absolutely. And, but it's a graded dirt road, but it's got washboard and it's kind of a rocky surface, not a sandy surface. So it beats the hell out of, yeah, there it is. 
So it, it beats the hell out of suspension. And so he had uh, told me that, hey, he'd taken the vehicle there. And when he got back to the pavement, the, sh the, tr the truck was just porpoising all over the place. And, the sh and he took it to the dealership. This guy was the consumer advice ed editor, not one of the technical editors. So he didn't really know what was going on. And they said, hey, you blew out your shocks. What'd you do, jump this thing? And I just drove on a dirt road and he had. And, and mm -hmm. so he told me this. And then 2016 comes around and the new Ridge line comes out. And yeah, there you go. That's, like that's the, road the actual race. road. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not, it, it looks it's miserable. Than it looks, and it looks bad. And there's 27 miles of this each way because you have to turn Jesus. around and come back out. So when the new one came out, I went to San Antonio. They had the launch. There was a guy there talking about the suspension. He had the old parts and the new parts on the bench. And I told him about this story. He, he said, I know all about that. <laughs> uh, we got those shocks back. We heard hardy. all about it. And these new position uh, adaptive, I can't remember the, the word they use for their dampers, but they have uh, two operating ranges where normally a shock would have one. I can't remember what they call it because it, it's not. Anyhow, it was to be able to absorb the washboard without overheating the shock. Huh. And, wow. uh, and, and, and they went and took vehicles out there and actually duplicated the test and measured data. Whoa. Yes. So they did all that stuff. You hear that from journalists all the time, but it's rarely true. It's usually BS. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so the first thing I heard did when he said that is I know where I'm taking a ridge line <laughs> when the new one comes out. So mm -hmm. I took a ridge line out there and I floated this idea at work and you know, they wanted to bring a video camera out and enough people wanted to go that we brought a Tacoma TRD off-road, which we had. In the oh, fleet. that was that trip? Yeah. And we brought a, you know what I'm talking about. We uh -huh. had a, uh, uh, what was it? The Nissan Titan XD with a Pro 4X trip. And that was going to carry all the camera gear. And it was really just to see if the Ridgeline would survive. And about 10 miles in, we lost track of where the Titan was uh -huh. on a straight dirt road. <laughs> and so we were waiting for him and I started smelling some burning smell and it was coming from the Tacoma and the shocks had just totally exploded. Yeah. I remember, I remember the, reading that. Yeah, and, and there's a video of it too on YouTube somewhere. If you want to watch the whole thing. Wow. But, <laughs> uh, but the, uh, the Ridgeline's shocks survived the whole trip. One of them weeped a little bit, but you know, the difference is you've got an unsprung mass difference there. The Tacoma's solid axles, spring, big wheels and tires, and your Ridgeline is independent suspension, smaller wheels and tires. So the shock is barber just, you know, when you're in a washboard situation, it's what we'd call sky hook, where the, you can kind of imagine the truck body isn't moving and the wheels move it up and down. So the mass that's being dealt with by the shocks is the mass of the unsprung parts. And so, yeah, in an overlanding situation, you see all these people doing icons and all this stuff. But really, it's because this kind of washboard stuff really beats up shock absorbers. Hmm. And the reason why the, the Tacoma did the way it did is, you know, they had always specified back in the day in the 90s when I worked for Toyota and I worked on that project, the smallest shocks that Bill Stein sold, which is a 36 millimeter one. And that was the first generation Tacoma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the exploded ones from that trip. Oh, uh, you can see the the blue Bill Stein belt is, uh, uh, boot is just melted and, and you know, covered other in view. fluid. Huh? Oh, it, it looks just like it's. Up. I mean, yeah. it, it, it all came out in a couple seconds. On the way back out, we saw the oil streak. It was about 30 feet long. <laughs> so bad. So, so, so this is a 36 millimeter Bilstein. So I wouldn't put the blame on Bilstein. This is undersized mm -hmm. shocks for the truck. And, you know, the generation two and three Tacoma is 800 pounds heavier than the first small generation one truck that I worked on and had this mm -hmm. argument with and lost. And so one of the things I have in my driveway today is that lift kit. Yeah, that's still more belted, melted boot and lots of oil. <laughs> is, uh, is a lift kit they've recently brought out for the 
for the Tacoma. Okay. And the look of it is, uh, you know, you've probably seen it. It's for 2021 and 2020 models. It's two inch lift in the front, a one inch in the back. So it's kind of a leveling kit. But the main thing is it has the Bilstein 46 millimeter shocks on. What so they is in, more. so they gave you, uh, is it a, a 21 model year Tacoma? Yeah. So this kit, they announced it in February mm. and they put it on uh, a press vehicle and it's been circulating around. It started in the, e I finally got my hands on it. I'm going to look at it this mm. week. So what does it include other than the 46 millimeter shocks? Well, that's a lot. Uh, it has that. It has uh, a, uh, it uses the same springs. Uh, there's a, uh, it relocates the springs in the front to lift the front two inches. Uh, there's a one inch block and some U bolts in the back to, to space the rear axle up off the mm -hmm. springs up off the rear axle. Uh, it also has that grill with the Toyota spelled out, uh, which everybody likes. So it's a TRD Pro style grill. Um, and that's part of the kit. And it also, you can see here, the, the fog lights have been deleted because, you know, if you're an OE and you sell a lift kit that meets all regulations, well, if you lift it two inches, now your fog lights are too high. So they actually blank out the fog lights and pull them out. Interesting. Huh. So, uh, and then... Uh, yeah, but that's pretty much it. Uh, the, the front shocks are supposedly longer, although I don't have a number. So it actually might articulate more on my ramp with this kit too. But this is the kind of shock that, you know, we wanted back in the 90s when we founded right. this package. And I'm glad to see that even it's a, a, an aftermarket kit and you could put this on this SR5 or a, a Sport, you know, any V6 Tacoma that's a short bed uh, crew cab. Uh, four wheel drive and they just came out with it and so i'm going to see if it's any you know if it's all that it's cracked up to be but it has right. that one thing on it that i always wanted so <laughs> well it and sounds like it should have been there in the if first i place. had that <laughs> set of shocks on that truck when we took the ridge line out we probably wouldn't have had the same result so how because you know i think we probably talked about this last time but overlanders they're you know at least the Instagram overlanders, the favorite thing to do is just load the truck up with as much stuff as possible. So yeah. does the nature of the chassis body on frame or unibody and, you know, continuing the Tacoma Ridgeline parallel here, does that bear any impact with the added weight of everything on the ability to cope on that washboard? Well, I mean, the way it's, 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 it's a little of both, but I mean, you know, everything you're adding to the top is the sprung weight. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to increase your spring rate, increase damping and all of that to cope with the new weight of the vehicle. But on a washboard surface, it's the unsprung weight because the vehicle doesn't really move. It's really more about the tires moving up and down. So if you put 37s on a vehicle that came with 33s, you've just upped your unsprung weight a ton. And that mm -hmm. becomes the issue is what you do with your wheels and tires uh, in terms of the unsprung washboard bit. I mean, obviously this is all interrelated. You can't separate it completely, but the weight on the top, all the gear, all the, all the rooftop tent and all that, that's sprung mass. The wheels and tires and the suspension itself, you know, that's unsprung mass. Right. So wa washboard is, you know, as you saw in that Ridgeline versus Tacoma thing where the Tacoma with this puny 36 millimeter shocks didn't didn't survive, at least as far as the shocks went, the 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 Ridgeline did. And it was all about unsprung weight there. Do we know what diameter the Ridgeline shocks are from the fact? I don't. And it, I don't know that it, you would compare it in the same way because it's unsprung mass is so different that the requirements mm -hmm. are different. And actually it's got twin tube shocks. Whereas the Bill Steins we've been talking about both the new ones that I've got on this green truck and the up smaller ones on that older truck, those are both monotubes, which theoretically are better because the heat can come out easily. Cause it's mm -hmm. not like a thermos bottle. Theoretically. But, but uh, you know, in the case of the, in the case of the, the ridge line, it's just, less weight dribbling all the time and it right. i did the math for 54 miles at the spacing of that that was like a quarter million cycles which Jesus. is a lot 
Oh, my God. <laughs> so the moral of the story here, as is usually the moral of the story, uh, less weight, better. Less weight, better. And, you know, overlanders bring a lot of stuff. And, you know, that's the best part of it. But, you know, the more weight you you bring, the more you're going to have to mod your suspension and the more you're going to get into unknown territory because, you know, are all those pieces that you buy really suitable with each other? You know, with an OE set up, at least, you know, that's all been vetted as one complete package. Right. And as soon as you start changing stuff, well, you might end up with a good combination. You might not. So that's why there's all kinds of endless debates in forums about what's the best setup, you know, and mm -hmm. the answer might be completely different based on how much stuff one person has and what tires they're oh. running and how they weigh. It gets really <laughs> yeah. complicated and quick in, in a hurry. Right. And the forums are great for a lot of things, but you know, if somebody posts what's the best suspension for a Tacoma, like if you have somebody who lives in Utah and has 500 pounds of stuff on their truck and you have somebody who lives in like Pennsylvania and has 500 pounds of stuff on the truck, you might get like the same answer, but via totally different methods to yeah. getting there it's, or totally different answers. It's tough when you start doing your own suspension tuning and, you know, you're basically just kind of doing it by catalog, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's a, you know, you, you might, you might not end up with a better setup. Certainly you need to upgrade if you add weight, but what's the yeah. best upgrade? uh decreasing weight so speaking yeah. of um speaking of weight so i want to get to some of the other uh other things you've seen and driven oh, been around and, and delved into uh, so yeah speaking of weight let's uh let's go for the heaviest of the heavy you recently saw the hummer ev and suv yeah i did i got a chance to look at them i couldn't drive them i couldn't really do much you know, they're, they're show vehicles, I, I, I guess I would call them. Uh, 9,000 pounds of show vehicle. Well, yeah. you know, do we know where the 9,000 pound number came from? Because they released it. They did. They did. Okay. Well, I'm behind. I missed that press release. Uh, I, I wouldn't be the one. Let, but, let me uh, verify. Well, no, that's, that's fine. But I mean, and we're talking curb weight, not GVW R. GM confirmed the curb weight would be 9,046 pounds. Wow. Well, I mean, it's big. Let's, this thing's as wide as a Raptor or a TRX. You start there. And so that gives it a bunch of heft. And then, you know, this, this thing has a battery pack. It's double stacked and full width, almost from the back of the front tire to the front of the back tire, all the way across. I mean, it looks like the step bars actually bolt to the battery pack. That's not quite true, but it's kind of in that proximity. <laughs> it's that, it's that far pushed uh, out. Well, they're right out. The, it, so they're, you know, the width and wheelbase of this thing, I think is all about getting a big battery in there. Of course, batteries weigh. It's got three motors and it's got some kind of mechanism that, you know, gives them rear wheel steering and that's going to add weight. And uh, so, yeah, I think, uh, it doesn't, I mean, it's a big number, but when you look at everything they're packing into it, that's where you get. And the interior is really wide and it's, you know, pretty deluxe. And uh, yeah, it's like a lot. Age one wide or? No, wide. well, it's, it's, <laughs> it's as wide as a Raptor in terms of the number, mm -hmm. but it's not H1 wide inside. It's not like there's a ping pong table between you. Yeah. You can't set oh, up. Hey, how are you over there? <laughs> yes, it's not that, but it is wider than, our, you know, with a, with a Raptor and a TRX, you've got the standard truck and all the width is this fender flare sticking out. I think this is more, the whole thing's wider. Okay. And that center console is, you know, pr pretty wide. It feels wider than a Ram 1500 inside. It looks wider than my suburban center console. Yeah. Because it looks so, like the, the material on the outside edge of that black tray, that, mm -hmm. that tray is drastically bigger than the charging plate that I have on mine. And the, right. this, the material on the outside looks to be the same size. So they, it looks mm -hmm. like it's a couple inches bigger. Yeah. We saw, so, yeah, it, 
we saw an H1 Hummer the other day and it was a couple, just two people in it as they turned in front of us. And I, and I point out to my wife, like only four people can fit in that. <laughs> and they had the back off. So you could actually see there were only two captain's chairs in the back of it. Nice. Yeah, I think that's because there was something big going on in the center console that had to do with propulsion. <laughs> mm -hmm. Something. Portal <laughs> axles and drive shafts, maybe. I'm yeah, sure. all of that. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it's, 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 you know, it was hard to get a real sense of how big it is because of the tilt up concrete structure it was in, you know, wasn't outdoors, there wasn't other cars around <laughs> it really, except for another Hummer. So it was hard to get real, a real good read on how big it is, but it's, it's big. It looks it. Yeah. So that'll, I mean. Substantial. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to trying it out. Uh, I'm not sure what's what the, um, what's the weight limit on your ramp? On your ramp? <laughs> you know, I'm going to have to do some calculations now that you bring it up. Because <laughs> this would be the one to break it if there's going to be anything to, to touch it. Well, that do I've it already, you know, my, the, the TRX already got me thinking I need to add a one foot extension on the, on the back end. <laughs> Because I, I came within this far of the end with the TRX Jesus. and I didn't disconnect the stabilizer bar because it doesn't have a disconnectable push button one. And oh, so I got a little count. grief yeah. for that. But I wasn't in any hurry to drive it off the end of the ramp. So I didn't go there. <laughs> Straight into your house. And I tend not to disconnect the stabilizer bars unless it has a built-in factory system. I know I did it on the ZR2, but it was kind of to prove a point mm -hmm. that I didn't think it was really worth it. And it wasn't. It was like a really small gain there. Right. The uh, the guys that I ride for at UTV Driver actually just just built a ramp. Or they had a ramp, and now they're they're doing RTI scores for every everything that comes through the shop. And it's the same thing. If it doesn't have you know like quick release sway bars, yeah. then there's then it, it you know it's not something a normal person's going to do. Not like a Rubicon or a Bronco where you just push a button. Yeah, I don't want to get into the, the the place where you're recommending that people do it because they see a benefit. And it's like, well, if you drive around with your stabilizer bar disconnected, <laughs> that's a recipe for big oversteer and the wrong kind of yeah. emergency. Uh, Ross has practical experience with that. My first fourth gen forerunner, the prior owner to me had saws all them off and uh, it thus had no sway bars. And, uh, and you know, on like 255... <laughs> You wrote in 85s. It, Chris? it no, was I didn't. Uh, yeah. It, no, my, everybody called it the roller coaster. So <laughs> I would I would refuse a ride in that truck it unless it, the only alternative was walking. Scary. Um yeah, you know, you make an evasive maneuver on the highway and it's like tank slapper. But that that truck is now in Haiti. So <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, anyways. You, I mean, you've driven so many things recently. I don't know where you want to go, what you want to touch on. Sprinter uh, van. Sprinter van, yes. Okay, Sprinter the van. Saga I, the... I, have, I have never driven a Sprinter van. But your, uh, your, your brother has. My so... brother has. And my brother had an interesting <laughs> experience. Uh, you know, it's a 2016, so I guess it's fairly recent. He hasn't driven it a lot. It doesn't have a ton of miles. It's not, you know, it's kind of a work in progress. He's building it out inside, but it's, you know, he's busy. He's got a job. And uh, so he hadn't, uh, you know, it's not like the, th the thing's used up at all. And uh, so he took it to Michigan and back, you know, because he's moving and he had stuff in the back. And on his way back to uh, California, he stopped and uh, Rifle, Colorado, I think it was. Some small town. I have been there. <laughs> You've been to Rifles. You know what Rifles are. Like. He, he stopped in the in the rest area to walk his dog and you know, got back to the thing and it would not start. It would huh. not light up. It would not crank. It was just dead, dead ski. And this is a Sunday. And, uh, at, oh, and like, that's I the began. middle of nowhere. Yeah, and so he's uh, calling me up and trying to figure out how it, it, what's going on, and I tried to help him diagnose it. And you know, th those things have a big plug on the dash. 
next to the gas pedal, about a foot to the right of where your toe would be. That is a kind of a disconnect because the battery is underneath your feet as a driver in a compartment. And then it goes through the firewall to the, to the, to the engine compartment. And there's somehow there's a, a big uh, copper stud with this thing put on it. And, I, you know, I'm looking up on, on, on blog posts and seeing that sometimes people have kicked that loose and got similar things, but there was no, it was fine. And that was one of the first things he checked. Mm -hmm. I know people who own these things will unplug that to like prevent vampire drain while the thing sits. Um, I don't know if that's what it's for, but that's what people do use it for. So uh, anyhow, that wasn't it. And, you know, it was a five-year-old thing. So he's thinking, well, maybe it's a battery. And there happens to be an O'Reilly about a half mile, three-quarter mile and, and, a, and a Walmart. So he went over there and bought a roller cart from Walmart so he could buy a battery from O'Reilly so he could get it back. And this all didn't work. And so Monday, he's trying to call and get somebody to work on it. And it seems like as soon as he got into the electrical part of it, the mechanics are like, nope, nope, it's got to go back to a dealer. And the closest one is in Denver. And Denver is like 190 miles away, and I don't know how many dollars away. So, uh, yeah, the, you either had, he either had Denver or Flagstaff or Albuquerque or Salt Lake City. You know, that's a huge area yeah. that the Four Corners is kind of in the middle of that and yeah. supposedly Overland Central. And you have to kind of leave the area if you need any, any kind of work that requires a diagnostic equipment and a technician that's Mercedes certified. Mm -hmm. So he got on the road to uh, to tow it back sometime partway through Monday after he exhausted all the local opportunities. And on the road, they told him that they could see him in August. Oh, Two months. What? It was the next opening. And what's the date on this? Him. This is June 7th. Yeah, so this like isn't even three weeks ago. Yeah. The 23rd. Right, right. This so is... he was in August as his, as his, as his uh, estimate of when they could see him because they were all backed up, oh. apparently. There's, I don't know, uh, <laughs> along with all this high prices of used cars, there's a lot of people keeping their used, I, I don't know. So anyway, he basically just showed up and left it on their doorstep and spent the next couple of days poking them. And finally, they took pity on him and they, they, they did something. And at the end, uh, ended up being something with a wire harness had shorted out mm. on the engine compartment side of it. And... Uh, you know, he bought a battery, but the battery was five years old anyway. Probably no big oh. loss there because he needed it anyhow. But yeah, he got on the road, but it was it was it was more of an ordeal than I would have thought. You know, a overlanding sweetheart vehicle. Exactly. You know, In overlanding, the people of Moab and Grand Junction could just work on these, but it didn't oh, seem to be geez. the case based on what we found. Now, I guess if it would have been a a shock or a spring or something related to chassis, it wouldn't have been a problem. But since it right. was electrical and wire harness related, nobody wanted to touch it. Once, once things enter a loom or like, you know, go through a firewall, that's when chances are you need somebody who's like full-time job it is to work on these things. That's, that's where they come in. Yeah. Yeah. I can't believe that Mercedes Benz doesn't have something closer to that area like they're well, here's all the thing. over the place out there here's the thing that i thought was the weirdest part is daimler trucks uh is associated with freightliner and freightliner has a dealership or dealership that sells free uh freightliner and there is such a thing as a freightliner badge engineered version of the Sprinter. There is a freight line of Sprinter. Yeah, yeah. So in, in Grand Junction, I contacted them and they're saying, yeah, that has to go to Denver. <laughs> At that, because they didn't have anybody that was Mercedes certified. Oh my gosh. And, you know, they also had RVs that they sold, which were all based on Sprinters. cut body versions of the yeah, Sprinter. Freight liners. Yeah. Like, I mean, 
it doesn't seem like I, it seems like I want a Ford Transit if I'm going to make an overlanding vehicle because there was one in Rifle and in Grand Junction and Glenwood Springs, Ford yeah. dealerships. There's, yeah, there's Ford dealers all across there. Jesus. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know, man. In, in fact, the, the dealerships in Glenwood Springs are some of my favorites because they're just like tiny little dealers across the road, the frontage road of I-70, but they have awesome names like Bighorn Toyota. Like, yeah. Yeah, there isn't there isn't a Mercedes dealership in that area. You'd think there'd be something. I mean, like Vale's not that far away. One of the people that, uh, yeah, <laughs> somebody rep- replied to one of my tweets to the effect that yeah, we have our our, our people take the, our vehicles to Denver when they need service. <laughs> Was that you, you that replied? That? Yeah, it was, was me. <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't notice that. No, because because Jonathan Klein said something along the lines of like, why don't they, like, why is that not there? And I was like, well, they just have the servants driving back to Denver. They don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wasn't going to. I used the S word. Too. Good for that. Good, good, good on you for uh, sneaking under the radar. That's funny. Yeah, the last thing you want when you're in the middle of the no of like, you know, not uncharted territory, but a, a new place for you is to uh, not be able to get your shit fixed. So Yeah. I mean, I had a bad experience with my JK. I was out in the middle of nowhere, out I-40, but 30 miles off the freeway, you know, kind of Mojave Trail area, but not Mojave Trail. And I was out there and my, and I stopped the Jeep. I was out hiking and turned the key, nothing dead and had been running all day and I couldn't figure it out so a buddy happened to be nearby with an FJ cruiser but he was I don't know he was maybe quarter miles away away so I had to kind of wave him down he came came over and we jumped it and it would run and as soon as he pulled the jumper cables cables off it would die Hmm. and we ended up trial and error, figuring out that if I disconnected the battery and he jumped the car without the battery in the circuit, it would run. And so that's how I got home. And I found out that the battery had developed some kind of an internal short and it was basically just, so, it wouldn't run with a battery in the circuit, but if the battery was out of the circuit, I could run it on the alternator. So I drove it 250 miles home and just left it <laughs> In on the, the alternator drive of Jesus. a and put my key in the night box and said fix it fix wow it. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a battery problem so an, a yeah. new battery would have solved it basically <laughs> that one a battery solved and that's what i thought my brother's problem was and that's one of the reasons why he went hmm. with the battery but justified it five years old if it's not yeah five if it's years not the right thing i didn't waste any money mm-hmm. yeah it's but it, it you the, the part I loved about the story was you bringing up the point of like, if you can't get this repaired here, why yeah. are you then taking this into the wilds of places? Like, yeah, he was on the freeway in, in rifle. He wasn't 50 miles off the freeway. Yeah. Like he's literally he on I-70. Exit, as he could have been. Yeah. He was on I-70. I, I love that the, like the, the backwards to Denver was the better tow than like up to Salt Lake <laughs> or down to Flagstaff. Like, he literally yeah, had yeah. no good options. I think the other option was uh, was St. George, Utah, but that was still further. At least it was in the direction of home. But right, it was the, know, dir- the main direction of that. travel, but still not good. <laughs> no, it would have been mm-hmm. 100 miles longer of a tow than the one to Denver. Oh, geez. AAA yeah, doesn't so- go that far. <laughs> it it does yeah. make you like evaluate. Like, listen, if this is what we're choosing to drive like i want to have like there are jeep dealers in the middle of nowhere like there there are jeep dealers in small towns there's well i hate to bring it back to toyota but there's a reason why a bunch of people are overlanding in tacomas and forerunners and you don't see as many oh yeah land, ro- land rovers as you used to mm-hmm. you know they yep. seem to have and to, you know if this isn't going to leave me stranded in the middle of nowhere which is where i want to go Right. And, uh, you know, uh, on the flip side, like there's a reason Dan Grek chose to drive a JK around Africa, you know, like parts are simple. They're known entities. Yeah. They tend to make the same parts for an extended period of time. Mm-hmm. 
and in, in pretty substantial quantities. So, you know, you didn't want him to overnight parts from Japan. Oh. Yeah. I, you know, I just don't know if, if this experience is typical, if it's like a bunch of people are shaking their heads. Yeah. Or, oh no, no, mm-hmm. he should have called this guy. He would have fixed it. You know, I, uh, it, it, when I was, we made dozens of calls. So this is where we ended up. When, when I was researching a bigger vehicle that we needed, just because too many kids, um, I looked at Sprinters and it seemed to be like if you used it regularly, you had less issues. But anybody who let their vehicle sit for even the smallest amount of time started to develop quirks like this, mainly like in exhaust systems for whatever reason on the, the hmm. diesel vans would have exhaust issues interesting yeah like a lot of the guys that let their cutaway rv sit have issues like their 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 mantra is like you got to get out and drive it you yeah it's an rv <laughs> that was one of the things we thought about is maybe it ran out of death and it just wouldn't start but it wasn't that at all he had filled it up but you know that's the kind of thing that can create a no start situation oh yeah those trucks go like anything that has one of those systems tend to go into limp mode if you run out of it yeah, you know, just, you get all kinds of warnings. I mean, I've driven uh, Ram 1500 deliberately into that zone just to just to kind of document what it does. And if you if you get caught out there, you are not paying attention and haven't been for a week. You know? <laughs> it, it has said something to you. <laughs> yeah, you have been warned many, many times. Dude, my dad has a 2500 with a Duramax. Should so show off. And well, it's a it he bought it last year CPO and this was his second one and the the one he had before he bought new in 2006 or 7 and it didn't have the DF or def you know system and when he bought this truck he didn't know it was a thing until it flashed on the dashboard the first time the tank got low and oh, it was no. kind of a rude awakening. And, you know, he got caught totally off guard without any extra fluid. And now it's like there's always a, an extra two or five gallons of it, you know, in the trailer, in the truck, somewhere. So, it's, yeah, it's uh, not hard to deal with if, if you just know you got to deal with it and keep on top well, of it. And it's pretty cheap and you can have Amazon bring it to your house. So you never have to really deal. <laughs> We don't have death at the pump very many places in California. I know people in other places are saying, you're just starting to pop up here. Yeah, I don't have that, but... uh, It's not that hard to deal with in most vehicles. Yeah. In his (laughs) truck, the filler is in... If the engine compartment's a rectangle, it's in the the middle of the engine compartment, three quarters of the way back towards the firewall. Oh, I remember this. I remember a, this. I think this is yeah. a pretty new one. It's a well, 2018 or 19. Yeah, I think I saw this at the launch and I was thinking, what the and heck? Did they like, I'm five foot nine. Not a short yeah, truck I'm, either. No, yeah. the fucking hood is like <laughs> on my chest. I, the hood I'm, is five foot nine. <laughs> dude, it's <laughs> like I'm, I'm, do, I'm on like full TP toes to get, you know, and it's, they make stools. My dad and my brother are taller than I am. They can they can deal with it, as far as I'm concerned. They're they're driving the Silverado up to New Hampshire this weekend. I have the Ridgeline, so you can reach every part of a Ridgeline's hood. Yeah. You can reach every yeah, part can. of a Ridgeline. Period. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's so good. So what else, what else should we touch on in our in our last few minutes here, Dan? Um, Bronco Sport. Bronco Sport. We have Tycon Defender, TRD Pros, Ram T Rex Zero Two. Uh, I gotta say that the uh, well, uh, maybe we can do two Bronco okay. Sport and the Tycon Cross Turismo. Yes, I've driven quite a few Tycons, and you know, a couple of I, I, I know a guy, and uh, so I got <laughs> this in this Cross Turismo, but I had a really short window to use it. I think I had three days, and so you know, I have a, a range loop that I do around my house. Uh, it, it goes around, as I call it one lap of Orange County. It's a 115 mile loop. <laughs> and uh, I did two, two loops uh, and had 
you know, then see how many miles I have left. I went 284 miles in the thing. I think it's rated at 217. I didn't one, know what the rating was. 284? One charge? Yeah. Yeah, one charge. Wow. And, that is strong. Uh, on a regular Tycon 4S, I did 304. And in both cases, that was like 33% more than the rating. And that's mm-hmm. pretty common. It's, you know, EV range is not like MPG. You know, you have to really try and you will still be disappointed that you didn't hit your, your car. <laughs> right. But in an electric vehicle, if you just pay half, a little bit of attention, you can beat the range. Mm-hmm. There's one brand that's an exception. And I know my namesake company that I no longer work for has, <laughs> has made hay on that. But, uh, but it's true. I mean, when I worked there, you know, any of the models S, X, three were really hard to, to get to the range and you just never did. But this, uh, it was just fantastic. And this is the one to get because, you know, that's got actual cargo storage area. You know, the regular Tycon, when you open the trunk, it's a little bit like a, a VCR slot, you know, locate loading stuff. In the back. <laughs> it's and like the front out, of most other Porsches. Yeah. It's like literally a boot. Is a, is, a, is a narrow, you know, area of glass between the elevated mm-hmm. package shelf and the low roof. This, this thing's great. And it, and it looks really tough. And, uh, the rear seat is uh, a little bit more accommodating because the roof line's higher. And uh, yeah, and you know, and it goes down the road real nice. And it has enough ground clearance and adjustable air suspension system that you can actually take it in the dirt. Now I took it mm-hmm. to the Alabama Hills. I figured I'd go go uh, troll the Instagrammers there and uh, the overlanders and there were a lot of them who were staring at this thing and yeah. i, I what, couldn't go very um, fast because you can see it has ultra low profile well you can't see yeah what kind of tires it has are ultra they low, low profile pilot sport four cu- i can't remember which <laughs> jesus yeah, like- the pilot, but it was it was a summer tire that was intended for track use it was not a dirt tire and so i was keeping my speed down mainly so i didn't pop a tire uh but yeah we uh it was, it was great. Uh, this was the, you know, I had my road trip and then I, uh, and my, my city trip and, uh, and, uh, yeah, charged real quick and mm-hmm. I'm sold. I just need to be able to find one that I like that I can afford. And yeah, right now the golf is, is cool, but it's a lease. we got about a year to go and I got to think of the next one. And this is out of my budget. Right. Right. Yeah. We right. need like, I mean, there's been swirlings for, who knows how long about Porsche doing like, you know, a 356 or a 550 or something. And we, we need like a two thirds size and price Tycon cross Turismo is what, what we need from them. Well, you know? I, I, I keep hearing there's going to be a Macan, but uh, I don't know what Ooh, comes out. Dude, yeah, Macan EV from Porsche so would be fantastic. I think there's pictures of that somewhere. But uh, uh, yeah, challenge just Macan, accepted. I'll just take a Macan GTS. Done. So I like it. Uh, I mean, you know, it's you know, great. A nice, nice common. If you only had to have one vehicle and you still needed to have like practical things happening in your life, that's a good one. But uh, or GLA yeah. 45. <laughs> huh? Or GLA 45. Well, yeah. The. Uh... Oh, have you found something? What are we? God, that is heinous. That's almost as bad looking as a first gen Kai. Well, I hadn't seen any kind of renderings. That this is, is a, not a good I had seen like <laughs> pictures of, uh, of, of uh, prototypes in, in, you know. I saw there's camo, there's camo so the, ones running around like Nurburgring. Yeah. yeah, this is from uh, Car and Driver based on the watermark. But oh, every, yeah. everything about it said E Macan. Oh, yeah. No, that's that's definitely the the Tycon's front end. I'm not I a didn't super. Want to go with Makani? Oh, Makani. That would just Mache? technically be McCain. Mache? McCain, yeah. But spelled weird. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's move on. Um, uh, Bronco Sport. Yeah, I, I I had one of those and actually pulled the wheels off and had a good look at it. Took it up into the local mountains and did some off-roading on the fire roads up there and uh yeah it it did a really good job i mean you know it's based on the escape but it's got much shorter 
front rear overhangs, really short rear overhang. And uh, same wheelbase. Yeah, I believe so. And a little bit more ground clearance. Um, but uh, yeah, the suspension's really. Uh, Oh man, you're going through my history. Yeah, just well, I, 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 I thought <laughs> it was like the next is, image. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it turns, it turns out it was like four images apart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Apologies to the video viewers. It's okay. Uh, uh, but go. yeah, so I, I got put the you know do what I do in my driveway, take the wheels and tires off, and have a good look. And you know the front suspension is strut like you'd expect, but one of the things I noticed that was pretty nice, and maybe it's because of the Maverick, and I haven't really looked at Maverick tire sizes, but you know in a strut vehicle, if you're going to lift a, a Subaru or a or a Rav4, you get into the lower part of the spring seat and the tire, you know, get in contact because they don't usually leave a lot of clearance there, and it's usually like in the Flex's case, you couldn't even put chains on because there wasn't enough room. Uh, really? Chains are legal here. I know in Michigan they're not, but uh, we have to use them. Uh, and uh, but here there's a good inch and a half between the tire and the spring seat and even the strut inside. So if somebody puts a little bit bigger tire on this, I think it'd fit. Now, I can't say for wheel wells or fender liners or any of that, but that was nice to see. And then the rear had a real nice uh, uh, multi-link uh, with. Uh, you know, a, a, a style that I like, uh, control blade, Ford used to call it. Same kind of thing used to be on the Focus and used to be under the back of the Mazda 3 before they lost their minds and put a, uh, a twist uh, under it. Um, and uh, some Mazda 3. <laughs> yeah. So that's a really good suspension in the back. And then it's just got like lots of clearance, but, uh, you know, nice mode switches and uh, in the dirt, uh, you know, up at the top of uh, Santiago Peak where I was, I, guy in a jeep showed up and he's looking at and he's like is this the new bronco because it says bronco as big as life on the front doesn't say bronco sport bronco, bronco is like 48 point font and sport is like and more. only at the back only, only at the back, the back. I don't think yeah. it's on the front at all and uh hmm. so yeah and it's out you know well before the the big bronco so i think there's people out there who think this is the bronco and for Definitely. those people who aren't really off-roaders, it's probably enough Bronco for them. You know, it's 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 a pretty capable uh, dirt rotor. You know, and it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, it's a Bronco for the for the wannabe Bronco buyers who should really be buying the Outback Wilderness. It's yeah, it's, but I mean, if I was to take that on the same Death Valley trip to the uh, the the racetrack where the rocks move, uh, it would probably do well just because it's independent and going to have low unsprung mass and all mm -hmm. that stuff that works in its favor it, that worked in the Ridgeline's favor on that kind of trail would probably work for this too. Mm -hmm. I really that's, like it on a set of fair. KO2s. Yeah. Yeah. It's only a matter of time before Ford dealers start selling it on optional like method wheels and KO2s the same way you can buy a cross track straight from the dealer on methods and yeah. KO2s with mud flaps. So. Dude, if Subaru is not offering Sparkos, we got an issue like that. Those <laughs> rally wheels for the. Yeah. Okay, maybe yeah, yeah maybe so they I, are Sparko. So I was, uh, you know, more impressed with that than I thought I would be. You know, I, hmm. you know, it seemed to do exactly what it needs to do. You know, especially knowing that there's a Bronco coming for the people who want more. So you had good insight. Uh, our editor Jeff and uh, Lynn Woodward did a comparison test with the Bronco Sport and a Cherokee Trailhawk. Yeah. And you had insight into uh, a realm of vehicle we don't always think about is the, the pull behind the RV version. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's weird because I, uh, I, I was in, you know, involved in towing when I was at Toyota. But one of the things we were I was bringing up is that Toyota didn't allow any vehicles to be towed behind motorhomes. And the Japanese guys, when I talked to them, they were like, why would you do that? You know, you put it on a tow truck. I'm like, no, no, people do this thing with their motorhomes. And at the time, you know, the, you know, it was like the Saturn, the big deal with the Saturn is you could tow it with an automatic transmission four down behind a motorhome. And it was a really popular vehicle in that crowd for a while. And it actually made its way into some of their ads. And there were definitely vehicles that could be towed behind motorhomes in the Toyota lineup, but they just didn't allow it. And I think for a while they did finally start testing and allowing some of it. But, you know, 
it comes down to does your automatic transmission self lubricate if the input shaft isn't turning? You know, the okay. wheels are driving it backwards. And if that slings enough oil around that it lubricates the transmission, you're good. But if you're basing it on the input shaft turning, then it doesn't work and you burn up your transmission. And uh, so there's a subtlety there. So generally, most people do it that way. And it is a problem with automatics and you can't tow them four down. But if you have a Jeep or, you know, something <laughs> with a transfer case, you can put yeah. the transfer case in neutral mm -hmm. and then put, ironically put the automatic transmission in park. And then all the rotation happens in the, in the, uh, in the transfer case. So the difference between the Bronco Sport and the Cherokee Trailhawk here, long story short, is the Trailhawk has a low speed transfer case, has high range and low range, and you can right. put it in neutral, hmm. and you can tow it behind a motorhome. And that's, there's like three versions of the Cherokee and one of them you can't because it doesn't have the right active drive to off-road system. Right, it's the one that's not trail rated. Yeah, you can add, well, there's a version that isn't a Trailhawk where you can put that on it and, okay. and tow it behind a Just motorhome. the transfer case on a non-Trailhawk. It's yes. got a, it, yeah, you can do mm -hmm. that on a non trail hawk, but the trail hawk adds a, a rear locker, uh, which is more of a mechanical locker than what's going on in the Ford. So, yeah, the tow behind a motorhome are, you know, once you get to a certain, yeah, you know, the trail hawk, I, I think two people I know have bought those to tow behind motorhomes because I pointed it out. And they need, you know, it's a great thing to be able to do to go off roading when you get where you're going. Wasn't there recently a guy who left True. his, I think it was like a Rubicon, but in like low range as he towed behind, like he didn't achieve oh, neutral. Oh, yeah, and it he detonated. It. yeah. And it went to a hundred thousand RPM and yeah. grenaded the engines. Yes. You must put the transfer case in neutral. Oh. That is a big point, but yeah, you, you will see, uh, like H2 Hummers, probably not the new one because it's electric, but you will see H2 Hummers flat towed behind motorhomes. You'll see Ram 1500s flat towed behind motorhomes. Uh, you know, all of those, you know, low range transfer case with a neutral position, it's generally acceptable. Obviously, I read your owner's manual, but uh, it's generally acceptable. I'm trying to think if my Suburban has a neutral position on that or not. Well, there are some Probably that does. don't. There are some that don't, but, and there's some GM systems that don't have low range, but they have four wheel drive. Is it a 4L60 or 4L80? Or those are transmissions. I know, but they usually come with a different transfer case. I don't know what my what my transmission number is. <laughs> Fair enough. I have the build sheet around here somewhere. <laughs> I do know, fun fact, side note, that uh, aftermarket tuners look at a 4L60 and know that that can take 600 pound-feet of torque. And they look at a 4L80 and know that it can take 800 pound-feet of torque. It's like the, the shorthand math that they do. <laughs> Yeah, I may have been looking at turbo kits for the Suburban the other day for absolutely yeah, so, no reason whatsoever. <laughs> oh, there are many reasons to do that. <laughs> Just because they're available. And I was like, I wonder what it costs. <laughs> I'm running into any, uh, any sponsors out there want a turbo Chris's Suburban? Let us know. <laughs> <laughs> Kids, we're, getting to, we're getting to baseball really fast this week. I would put the loudest blow off valve I could find on that thing. Cause it would be just <laughs> dumb. How did we the, end up here? The oh, two, 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 on a suburban. Come on. Oh, like yeah. that's not right. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Which I know I've seen like, uh, express vans and GMC Savannah's with turbos and superchargers on them. Cause it's just the same engine that just shove it back a little bit. Right. Like, Oh, uh, it does look like I do have neutral available on my switch. Yeah, I think uh, the manual ones is pretty obvious, but the electronic ones, yeah, sometimes it's one of those switches that looks mm -hmm. like push it with a paper clip on the side of an iPhone. That's exactly it's really obvious. Yeah, the the <laughs> N is like uh, if the lights on, the N lights up, but the N is not yeah. there for you to see otherwise. Like, yes, but yeah, the guy in the Jeep 
uh, uh, learned the hard way that it's very important to make sure you do that. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Jeep. I had a 2004 Tahoe that would on the highway occasionally go into power off mode transfer case, trying to get itself into neutral on the highway. Mm. What? Yeah, it was fun. It's definitely not good. No, it wasn't. There was, there was a lot wrong with that vehicle <laughs> is the long and the short of it. I, th- I found an image of the transfer case literally exploded. Oh, oh my god that's is this not, the one we're talking about this is i think our, so uh hundred thousand rpms and then yeah boom. so i had a weird uh help out fix and i don't know that i've ever talked about on the show um i had a 94 land cruiser for four years five years and uh, the, the great thing I enjoyed about that truck is that the local community of other Land Cruiser guys were normally pretty good about like if something broke, somebody knew what it was and could give advice or, or better yet, a, the guy who owned this particular F, FZJ80 was in Houston. He had lent it to some family friends who had been up in Iowa. And they were driving back to Texas, coming through Kansas City. And for whatever reason, his front drive shaft disconnected at the transfer case, still attached to the front diff. As I recall, those are bolted on. They are. (laughs) Yeah. Great, great big bolts. Um, Yeah. And a, it was a shop that normally has a pretty good reputation down in Texas that did the work too, but um, it disconnected at the transfer case on the interstate. So at 70 miles an oh. hour, <laughs> the front wheels are still being driven by the rest of the momentum of the vehicle. There is a stabilizing bar that runs underneath that. So it didn't allow the drive shaft to go down to the ground. Uh, but basically the drive shaft just beat the underneath of the truck oh. to a pulp, including cracking the transmission case. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. Cause that's cause next to the transfer case. It was yeah. all right there basically. Oh. And so this is just a drive shaft doing this underneath the truck. So, um, oh my God. yeah, we, and the owner of this truck is in Houston. The couple here with the truck have no idea what's going on. They were much older and, I think they were missionaries of some kind, uh, but the local guys basically, I, yeah, I didn't, we, I didn't stop to ask. Um, <laughs> we basically diagnosed it for him. Somebody had a used transmission sitting on a pallet. Uh, there was w- money like wired over and we put a new transmission in it, put new lines, put new rear seals in. Cause we're there. Right. Might as well just put them right. in, like, sure actually connected the drive shaft to the way it was supposed to be connected some of the bolts as we took the drive shaft off were literally like finger finger loose like finger tight like you just were able to yeah. uns- like this is supposed to definitely be torqued down so uh Wait, some um, of the bolts were still in some of them were on the oh, on the on the front oh okay okay yeah it was it was a very weird somebody uh, forgot the last step Must yeah have had somebody uh Start telling them jokes or something. Exactly. So we, up to. we we replaced like every seal, like transfer case seals, like rear main seal. Like we we're like, I've never seen. Uh, well, the glory of the truck is it had a lift kit, so we could just like slide underneath, drop the transmission down, slide it out, nice. slide, and then well, like, like once you the transmission's out, there's all kinds of room underneath there. Like you can do whatever you want. So much room for activities. So uh, much room for activities. So yeah, it was easy to replace yeah. the rear main once you get all that out. So anyway, just random. I, I appreciated those guys. They're like I learned a lot. Like I didn't know what I was doing. I just stood around and watched. And I was like, should I do this? And they're like, yeah, sure, do that. <laughs> but it's it's yeah, things spinning underneath vehicles are normally bad, especially if they're disconnected. I, I don't, I can't one up you there. I, I was driving across Texas in a GT 500 once and we were doing a cross country trip. That's probably 12 years ago. And uh, all of a sudden we start hearing this 
right between our seats and it's really loud and this is a borrowed car and it's what uh it's just to paint the picture what year gt500 is this uh it was a new car at the time oh so oh. probably 2007 2008 oh, Jesus. they had done some kind of a launch in atlanta and one of our staff did the launch and then i came in with a photographer and we did a cross country it was right about the time carol shelby passed away we didn't plan it that way, obviously, but it turned into a Carol Shelby Memorial photo essay trip. And I don't even think it's published anymore. So, Chris, oh, you know, I've, I've tried know. so hard. I, you were lucky. Know, Edmunds, Edmunds did a redesign of the site and I think it got lost. I think, oh, I no. think the, the photo gallery's lost. There might be a, a one pager. But, anyhow, uh, so this thing's like making all kinds of racket and we're thinking, oh my God, it's broken. What are we going to do? So we get off to a uh, parking lot somewhere and we don't have any way to jack it up. So I drive it up onto one of those curbs, you know, parking lot you know, that has a nice, I don't know why I had a curb cut, but I just drove it up on there and we crawled underneath. And all it was, was a, uh, a sticker that had like a barcode and the part number of the carbon fiber drive shaft. <laughs> it had just come unwrapped. And it was just beating it to hell it, itself to hell underneath. And so we just peeled it off. <laughs> Sound like in the world, right? Yeah, it was nothing, but it sounded like the whole, yeah, like you say, stuff spinning under a car. I can only imagine what a whole drive shaft would have done. I, I assume they thought the world was ending for that truck. Uh, I can only imagine what it would have sounded like. Uh, she That's said there funny. was a loud bang <laughs> and then yeah. a lot more. <laughs> She's sweet. Um I know it's getting late for Ross. It is. Dan, super early still. Um, <laughs> so you can rate and review the show on iTunes. You can like and subscribe on YouTube. Uh, you can follow Dan on Instagram and Twitter. It's at Suspension Tuna. Um, it's one of Dan, my... Chris more, Gordon. For the I was just saying, it's one of my more favorite uh, usernames because I can actually remember it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> What's the yeah. YouTube? What's the YouTube? YouTube? Uh, yep. Mine? Yes. Mm -hmm. Also, e either my name works or Suspension Tuna works. Okay. Say, either one. He's very consistent with his uh, branding. I appreciate that. Yes. <laughs> Except for Twitter. I, I can't get Twitter. I, I, I opened that account eight years ago, and I don't remember the login information, so I can't recall. <laughs> there is a Suspension Tuna Twitter account, but I never post there because okay. I can't get in. It's Edmonds. <laughs> Edmonds underscore it's test, involved. which which has created a few uh, confusing moments of late when yes. <laughs> <laughs> people complained about Edmonds.com's range tests and they started getting on my case for it. It's like, hey, I don't work there anymore. Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't help you. It's my <laughs> name, but don't <laughs> direct your frustrations elsewhere. Yes. Uh, that's funny. sweet. Uh, yeah. Well, Ross and I write stuff. ATV yep. writer, UTV driver. Yep. Square awesome. review on UTV driver and ATV rider right now. And also you have a Polaris to test this weekend? I have a uh, Can-Am. Can-Am. 650 Outlander. Yep. I was literally looking at the image and I forgot the name. Which on is it. good because my own Polaris is still down. So it's, it's still not working. Yes. Thank you BRP for stepping in. So I'm about to we have uh we're going up to new hampshire and friday is a, a light ride we're doing like 40 to 50 miles on i'm the only one on quad everybody else is side by side and uh saturday is supposed to be in excess of 150 what's the so, range on a tank of gas for that thing again i have absolutely no idea is it more than 150 we, we carry fuel Okay. And we well, also you don't. Somebody else does. I don't because there's not this is a loner. The only thing it, you know, there's like no extra. I mean, it, it's like fully, you know, geared up. It's got skid plates and a winch and and everything. Um nice. But we actually we in the state of New Hampshire, you can ride on non-highways. So the trail systems go through towns and you can just drive right up to the gas stations which, Sweet. you know, is the easiest thing in the world. So I'm about you're, to put probably over 200 miles on this thing. Your Can-Am's French-Canadian? 
Canem is, uh, you know, French. BRP is their Canadian company. So I, didn't, I didn't know that. They are. Yep. And uh, and whoever had this thing before me, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Man, I should whoever, stop my share. <laughs> <laughs> whoever had this thing before me, um, skid plate has a, a, a nice little uh, impact on it. <laughs> yeah, whenever I say that in a suspension deep dive, people always say, "Nah, you did that." <laughs> yeah. No, I I I um I learned early on to walk around and take a video of the machine or vehicle that I'm being loaned yep. immediately upon its arrival. So, yeah, no, but this thing, I don't know. It's uh yeah, we'll see. Sweet. More to come. Awesome. That's it. We we've done the show. <laughs>